Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be. Uh, thank you for joining our session here at Automation Anywhere's Imagine Conference. Uh, we're going to be talking today to you about a people-powered approach to automation or automating at scale. Um, this is an exciting trend that we're seeing in the marketplace uh, as companies really go to adopt uh, robotic process automation and the related automation tools in a major way across the enterprise. And we're hoping to educate you a little bit on what's happening uh, across companies in the industry and hopefully give you some insights you can apply at your organization. So with that, I'd like to introduce myself and my colleague. My name is Kevin Schwartz. I'm a partner or a principal at PricewaterhouseCoopers in our advisory business. Uh, I, uh, I also work very closely with Automation Anywhere and have for the last uh, few years as part of our relationship uh, with them uh, and uh, helping them with some internal initiatives as well. I have been working over the last few years uh, on literally dozens of different change initiatives at major corporations, applying some of the organizational uh, change efforts that you're going to hear about from in our discussion today, and I'm excited to share uh, those insights and lessons with you. Mike? Hey, thanks, Kevin. And before I get started, I'd like to uh, thank our friends at Automation Anywhere for having us here at Imagine again. Obviously, we'd prefer to be doing this in person, but uh, virtual have to do this time. So as Kevin said, my name is Mike Engel, and I'm the Intelligent Automation Leader in PwC Labs. Just to give you a sense of, of what I mean by PwC Labs, we're responsible for a lot of what you're going to hear about today as it relates to, to digitizing and our digital strategy overall. Um, our team is really responsible for a few key things. First of all, automating our core services, kind of what we bring to market, uh, digitally upstilling our team, which we'll talk an awful lot about today, and bringing our best of our innovation, the things that come out of our work, to the market. Okay, so let's let's start from the start. We all know that we're in the midst of a huge transformation that's being driven by technology. Uh, and much of it, I think, is being driven by the type of technology we're talking about here today, right, from an intelligent automation perspective. And I think from, uh, from my vantage point, there are three big trends in automation that we're, that we're following and we're all involved in right now. The first of it is really about the convergence of technology. Um, what we've done, if you think about it, over the past several years is really put some powerful, complex technology in the hands of employees. And that's going to continue to trend even faster. The second part of it is really focusing on value realization. We've been at this for a while. Um, we've had some ups and downs as, as an industry in terms of what we're able to commit to and what we're able to succeed at. But I think right now, what we're really gonna see is a real focus on broadening the, the processes that we're attempting to automate in the first place and really getting to value. And the third big thing is really changing the operating model, being more inclusive, democratizing this tech technology even further out. And again, that's a lot of what we'll talk to talk about today. These trends are really leading us to another big three things. First, meaningful impact on financial performance. Secondly, giving our employees back time to focus on their jobs, building these skills, and really focusing on the retention and attracting the right people to our organizations. And the third part of it is really making our businesses more nimble and efficient. So this discussion today is really focused in large part on the inclusive nature of this emerging operating model. As we look at how companies are actually applying this and getting value from it, the really interesting thing that we're starting to see in the marketplace is that it's becoming about a little bit more than just the bottom line. If you think about where did the RPA and intelligent automation, uh, artificial intelligence initiatives start? What was the purpose of them? It was really around savings and efficiency. Right? We started down this journey as an industry. All of us are touching the uh, automation topic in one way or another. Several years ago, because there was an opportunity to save effort, to make employees more efficient, to cut out manual tasks, uh, to streamline our organizations. And that's really about bottom line, cutting costs, improving productivity, improving profitability of organizations. Well, a cool thing happened along the way to the store. Right? As we applied this, the 
ancillary benefit has emerged that employees are happier. They enjoy their work better when they don't have to spend all this time doing manual tasks, moving big data sets around, doing the same task they did last week, the week before, uh, at, that is not value add, is not intelligence based. People don't want to go to work and just do the same manual task over and over and over again. So what we have been finding, and we're going to talk to you about how to really unlock this, is that when you go to apply these automation tools in a way that brings your employees into the game actively and really activates your full employee base, not just a small group of automation developers uh, in a back office somewhere, they, they rise to the challenge and they love it. They appreciate it. It drives morale. It drives employee engagement. It makes people feel more valued and more valuable. And that's, that is a huge opportunity that I think the leading organizations in automating at scale are just starting to see and tap the value of. So that's really where we're gonna uh, probe a little further as we go through our discussion today. And though, as Mike said, a lot of what we're gonna talk to you about today, we learned through our own internal automation initiative at PwC, we have, upskilled and trained uh, tens of we're getting over 100,000 people globally on some of these practices. And we've learned a lot from our own internal transformation, but we're going to share some anecdotes of organizations in the tech industry and in the financial services industry and in the automotive industry that um, are applying these tools as well. And we're going to do them generally in a blinded way, not naming specific organizations, but we're going to talk about examples and what these different companies have learned that can benefit your organization as well. All right. So as we go to tell those stories, one of the key things that has really come to life, as I said, as we engage the employee base, is this idea of automation at scale involving a hybrid approach to innovation and to automation. Companies historically started their automation journey with a center-led or an enterprise-led initiative, a team that sits in finance or sits in IT or sits in a central group that owns these tools and comes to the business unit, comes to the functions and asks the question, what problems do you have that we can automate for you? How do we solve a manual task with automation for you? That uncovers some big rocks, hugely valuable, is not going anywhere. The thing that is this new exciting addition to that, and when you pair it up into this hybrid approach, really just uh, supercharges or turbocharges the change to your organization, is more of the employee-led innovation or employee-led automation approach, where you are training actual individual financial analysis, customer service call center reps, you name it, employees in your organization who are dealing with manual tasks and data on a regular basis, you train them, you put these tools in their, in their hands and you say, go forth and automate your own jobs. There's approaches to how you control and govern that we'll talk about, but that's the, that's the nugget of what we're gonna be talking about today, putting these two things together. So how do we know that, Kevin? We know that because we did that, right? I mean, a, a few years ago, I'll call it three years ago now, maybe three and a half times flying, particularly over the last year, we knew that we were going to be disrupted just like every other business. Our, our, our entire employee base was in for disruption and we wanted to get ahead of it. So we took kind of a three prong approach and looked at it from the perspective of how do we prepare all of our, our back office systems, our ERP, our human capital systems and so forth to be able to capitalize on what we were going to do more broadly from a digital upskilling perspective. The second part of it was just that. How are we going to take all of our people, as Kevin was talking about, and really upskill them? And starting with what do they know now? What do they need to know? How are we going to train them? How are we going to ensure adoption and, and so forth? And at the same time, we were taking a, a real aim at all of our core systems or all our core services, actually, you know, from an audit and tax and advisory perspective, how am I going to make my people more efficient at what they do and thereby improve their interaction with their clients, improve their day to day jobs and that sort of thing? So when the, we did all of those three things, we started out, I'm not going to say we didn't fumble here and there, right? That's really the most important part of the learnings that we're bringing to market. When we started out, we kind of did those things in parallel. 
But when we started to bring together the, particularly the idea of the employee-led automation and the enterprise-led automation, the impact was tremendous. It was a real multiplier. And I'll get specific about that in a second. So Mike, you tell this story that we did this internally, but I know it wasn't without its challenges. And I know you actually weren't even totally bought into this approach on day one when you came into the organization. So can you talk a little bit about how you kind of got religion, uh, bought into this idea and some of the challenges we had to overcome as we went through this and the benefits we started to see. Out. Oh, man. Thank, <laughs> thanks for that, Kevin. I really appreciate it because I love talking about it. In this particular case, I loved being wrong. When when I was asked to, to or voluntold into this job that I have now in labs and love now in labs, it was um, it was an interesting conversation. It started with, we're going to do this amazing thing with, we're going to save millions of hours of capacity throughout our workforce. Okay. Intriguing. But we're going to do it by bringing together enterprise and people at some point. And <laughs> I immediately was a skeptic. I said, how the heck, Kevin, are we going to govern that? I'm going to put these types of tools, this type of power in the hands of 55,000 people in the U.S., right? And then eventually hundreds of thousands of people across the globe. How are we going to govern that thing? And then secondly, how am I going to get people upskilled enough to really be able to take advantage of it? And and th that really leads to the third challenge I was thinking of, or the third nightmare, I think, at the time that I had was, and then how am I going to ensure adoption after this gi ginormous investment we're about to make? So, yeah, those <laughs> you're right. I was a bit of a skeptic. But I'll tell you what happened along the way. Uh, you know, I started off, or my team started off really focused on the enterprise part of the automation, right? That's what we knew. That's what we were doing with our clients every single day. And that's where we started. And it was really impactful. And, and, you know, around that, there was an awful lot, and I think you'll talk in a little bit about the, the governance specifically, there was an awful lot of uh, process and rigor around it that allowed us to be able to get a view into what people were doing with these tools. So you can imagine, I mean, consider, if you will, individuals who build something that's impactful for them. But then imagine if, if, if the, the enterprise-led team picked that up and said, hey, if it's, in, if it's really valuable to you, maybe it's valuable to thousands of others, right? And that happened time and time again, where we would have a, you know, an automation that was being built by an auditor in the field that was helping him or her and their friends save a couple of hours a week. We took those from an enterprise perspective, kind of industrialized those, and literally that thing is saving tens of thousands of hours on an annual basis. So I'm a believer right? <laughs> from that point forward, I assure you. But I, I think the, the other point here is that there's a role for everyone in this environment, as you described it with both the, with both the employee-led and the enterprise-led. You don't have to be a developer, but if you want to be, be, we're going to encourage you. If you have the motivation, if you have the inclination, then you can participate as a developer, but you don't have to. What we do expect, though, is that you're going to be a consumer. Right. Once these automations are built and available to you, you're going to use them. You're going to consume them. And then there's the third kind of category that I continually think about because it's kind of where I live is people with ideas. Maybe I'm not necessarily a big consumer and I'm not a developer, but I've got some great ideas that I can share. And we'll talk a little bit about how that, that can be impactful as well. I, that's right on, Mike. I, that third category is actually one I think uh, people sometimes miss that. Those of us in the automation industry, we understand what these tools can do, but until you've been trained uh, uh, on the basics, until you've actually seen them in action, you may not even know what you can do with them, uh, and those opportunities may just get missed. So part of this upscaling we're going to talk about, it's not just about this idea that everybody in an organization is suddenly going to become a bot developer and an RPA programmer. No, it's the idea that if you bring your entire organization into the program and they understand these tools more deeply, they can both use the automations and they can come up with more suggestions, ideas for where to apply them. So with that, what we're going to do fairly quickly, we're going to talk you through four kind of building blocks, four key elements of how you would apply this hybrid model of enterprise and employee-led automation at scale together. It's about upskilling, then it's about building, then once you've built automations, you've got to be able to share them. And lastly, but far from least, 
is how do you govern all this? And how do you make sure that the fears that Mike talked about, which frankly, every IT organization in the world that starts to go down this path is gonna naturally think about as they should, how do you, how do you govern and deal with those concerns? Oh, we're gonna quickly talk you through each of these four with some case examples uh, from various organizations, and then we're gonna bring it to a wrap. So Mike, why don't you start us off talking about the upskilling and the training elements? This is uh, really one of my favorites. This is a, a recent example, but one of my favorite clients. This is a situation where we and Automation Anywhere Together years ago started this journey with this client, right? An automation journey. And it was really impactful from an enterprise perspective. Uh, they're probably one of the biggest automation clients on the planet, right? Um, and at, at some point along the way, People started to get more interested, perhaps, than the centrally led enterprise uh, automation group might have anticipated. And in this case, it was the finance organization said, yes, I'm bought in. I love this stuff, the automation stuff. Can you do it faster for me? And clearly, there's nobody could, you know, from a central perspective, be able to go at the pace that they want to go. So we work with this client, um, and the finance function, as I said, that, that to help them through that frustration of the pace. And so we, we helped them establish their employee led capabilities. And where we started with them was start with the, you know, the 50 or 60 people that we talked about that really had that inclination, that motivation, Kevin, to really be those developers, power users in that case, and, and start that champion network, start people talking about it, get interested, um, have sessions, have lunches and lunch and learns and that sort of thing, just to get people aware. And that's where, where we really started with them. And over time, we that that uh, champion network has grown to over 300 people and these people are out there on a daily basis finding opportunities for automation working with the teams to do the automation supporting others who are interested in this sort of thing um and in fact th that awareness has, has gone across over 7,000 people in this organization so you can imagine how impactful that is now i will tell you just during the engagement when we were working with this client in the first few months, they teed up over 300 use cases just with that, that smaller champion network that were, that were really valued at about $15 million in savings potential. So you can see the impact it can have and how quickly it can have happen, right? So this is uh, the key here, though. One of the things to consider is it didn't just happen. Right. There was a serious commitment up and down the leadership stack from the employee who was getting upskilled all the way to the to the to the top of the organization who was creating that mandate. So thanks, Mike. I'm going to build off that pun intended and talk about the the build process. So once you've trained an organization, you've upskilled them, pick the 300 people on the finance team uh, at this uh, bank that. Uh, Mike was just talking about as an example. You have to think about now, how do you enable them to apply what they have learned? And what we're talking about in the best practice is actually more than just a single tool. We see a lot of organizations that pick a tool. Let's, let's talk about Automation Anywhere core RPA technology. There is a lot you can do with that. The reality though is there are boundaries and edges to every specific technology. And if you think about the breadth of the intelligent automation process going all the way from advanced things like artificial intelligence, machine learning at one end through ETL uh, and OCR scanning tools, data migration, data visualization kind of at the simpler end of things, when you look at that whole spectrum, you have a really powerful stack of tools that can work together to solve business problems. And so what we've started to see really taking off is programs where the enterprise group comes to a group of users and trains them on a suite of tools. Even within Automation Anywhere's um, package, they have multiple modules. There is IQBot, which leans up into the machine learning area, as well as OCR capabilities. It's not just the, the core RPA. And then you pair that up with some of the other tools that do ETL advanced data transfers or data visualization and graphics and dashboarding. And you've got this really powerful package. 
underlying that is the idea of some of these things naturally lend themselves to the employee developer better than others. And you can see how we have these overlapping bars uh, at the bottom. When we did this with another client, a technology sector client that I worked with recently, where we rolled out a suite of tools, we actually consciously in that case kept most of the RPA and certainly the machine learning and the, the AI capabilities in the center. We trained the users on what they could do. We helped them understand the capabilities, but we only enabled a small set of kind of super users to actually develop their own bots. Certainly machine learning stuff was kept to the, the center development team. What we put in the hands of everyone, though, was some of the simpler capabilities, the OCR, the scanning, the data migration and data wrangling tools, the data visualization, so that when you had an end-to-end -end business problem, they could perhaps solve some of it with the support of the central team, and some of it they could go off and do themselves. And that allows them to build and solve problems, drive a lot more value for the organization. Kevin, like you, man, I get so excited about this technology and about the convergence of the technology, right? It, it is exciting. And we're seeing such cool things happen. All the things that you're talking about coming together into one um, is really cool. But you know what is even cooler is it's like kids on Christmas morning, right? In terms of the use cases that are coming out of it, when people understand that, you know, what the capabilities are more broadly, I mean, the, the whole thing is just throttled by your imagination. That's it. I mean, we can just really go far and talk about value realization, like I mentioned up front in the conversation. And that's how we're going to get to it, right? That's right. So with that, Mike, maybe that's a good jumping off point for the idea that as people start to create these valuable assets, as they build things off of the training that they've been given, now, and I love your Christmas morning analogy, now you, you got you to gotta wrap the presents and pass them around. You have to share the value. So maybe you can talk about the idea of what does it mean to create a sharing capability with an organization as part of this uh, hybrid automation model at scale that we're discussing. Yeah, and we'll continue to extend that that, that metaphor. So thanks. But uh, yeah, it, it really is important. I mean, we've talked for the last, uh, call it eight or nine years or whatever we've been in this, um, about the, the, the value of sharing the technology, right? Value of sharing um, and reusing these assets. And when you have kind of a contained um, center, it's a little bit easier, right? No less important, but a little bit easier when you start to really get out and broaden and broaden, you know, kind of who the who the potential developers may be. It is no less important, but it's a little bit more difficult. Right. So you have to offer people again, considering there are those at least two types of people, those who want to build and those who want to consume. You've got to give them a place to go. That's what we found out early on. We created this for ourselves, um, this capability to be able to share for ourselves to 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 uh, kind of scale, accelerate and scale our journey. But now we're bringing it to market as well because we see the value of it. People need to be able to, if you're going to have kind of an employee-led type of automation capability, they need an opportunity to be able to go out and find automations that they can use as a consumer, find automations that they can use as a building block, or maybe just as idea generators, right? You need to be able to find them, right? They need to be able to download them. And if you have the inclination, you need to be able to configure them for your facts and circumstances, right? Um, and then ultimately what we want people to be able to do is once they've come up with something, once maybe they've reconfigured something that, that's, you know, they think is even better than what was there before, they need to be able to share that out, right? And create this community, this affinity among people that are that are using this um, to be able to, to be more impactful with what they're doing with these types of automation. And what we found, Kevin, it's interesting, right? So there's that, again, that technical component of being able to go to a marketplace and be able to buy something off the shelf and maybe put something on the shelf. That's really cool. But what we're finding is that it's really become about community as well. You know, people want to share their ideas. They want to get ideas from other people. They want to maybe share an idea and have somebody else build it in collaboration. So it's just, I think that's been a really big part of acceleration that we've seen ourselves and with our clients is that, you know, just kind of building that community after, after I understand how to do it, I've learned and I'm really excited about it. I want to be able to do it in a meaningful way with visibility. Absolutely right. And, and Mike, if I can build off that, something that we've recently done internally, 
and you are at the center of this, maybe you can talk to a little more, is we created something we internally call digital labs, right? To host all those automations that our tens of thousands of employees were creating. And in talking with companies out in the industry with our, with our clients and, and partners, we found that there was an interest in accessing some of that intellectual property, some of those assets. Um, and so we've actually created a bit of a storefront uh, to share some of those automations. And there's some examples shown here on the screen with companies um, because we saw the, the, the hunger, the energy for that, right? And the idea that um, any company that wants to get to scale needs to create their own internal repository where they can share these things. Um, and something we're doing with our clients is helping seed that <laughs> by sharing some of the automations we've developed internally. Yeah, no, it's, it's really interesting to see people, you know, our clients' reaction to that. Right. It's when you talk about that, we, we, we call it digital on demand. When we talk about that with our clients, we're, there, there's a level of trust that they already have with us. There's an expectation that these things are brand aligned, that they're safe for their use, you know, that sort of thing, um, you know, as opposed to some of the other options they might have uh, on the Internet, for example. And so the reaction to not only can I can I use assets that I trust, but they are good for building blocks. They are really aligned with the, with the job I do. Right. It's been really fun to watch. Yes. And, and I think one of the learnings is in the early days, I think everyone was trying to have these bot stores of plug and play downloadable uh, automations. The reality is, I think we've all learned this in the industry. Uh, bots, uh, these automations always have to be configured or customized or aligned to the data sets and the systems that are connecting with, which are always different in every specific organization. So it's not about something that is as simple as an app store, you know, Apple app store download, and you just download it and you press play. But it is the idea that you can have on an internal repository or these various external uh, sources, something that gets you started, something that lets you jumpstart your build journey or gives you ideas for the types of problems that you can solve with RPA and other automation tools. All right, so with that, I'm gonna hit the last of the, the four elements, the topics that we wanted to talk about. Um, and this one, frankly, is somewhat the glue, the, the, the less sexy, but the super important glue that you have to have to make this model work. You need to have a governance approach. You need to have a structure and an operating model that lets everybody be comfortable that as you start to roll out automation tools to a broad employee base and a broad portion of your organization, that things aren't gonna get out of control. Right? And that's often a, a concern we hear, particularly from InfoSec, from IT uh, architectural folks, this question of, well, wait a second, if I give these tools out, uh, is it gonna be chaos? Are they gonna automate things that I don't want them to automate. Well, in practice, it's fascinating. We've actually found quite the opposite ends up happening. Um, and the, and I'll, I'll talk to you in a second as to why that happens. Uh, but the, the way that you need to start with these tools is think about the fact that there is a operating model with multiple paths here. That you start with your business units, your functions, identifying opportunities. And this has been the way the automation industry has always worked, is that process intake. What are we, how are we doing things today? What are we doing? What can be automated? What's overly manual? First and foremost, I always want to automate things in my core systems, in my big ERP, in my big CRM. We all know, particularly those of us who are at this conference, all know that you're never going to perfectly automate everything in your data lakes, in your central um, big systems. That's the nirvana. I, I doubt we'll get there in our lifetimes. That leaves the opening for RPA and other small automation tools and intelligent technologies. When you find those opportunities, now this is where we're talking about the hybrid approach. The first approach is for the bigger things, the bigger, more complex 
automation opportunities, you address via an RPA or some other intelligent technology solution via a central group. We call it a, a center of excellence in IT on this graphic, but it can sit in lots of places, but it's your central enterprise-driven automation team that takes those ideas in, develops the fairly meaty automation, and puts it into production. Well, in parallel, you can have local councils in your different functions that are managing all the upscaling and the build and the sharing that we talked about, and that are creating and supporting super users, individual employees who can apply low code methodologies. And in some cases, your advanced employees who could go develop their own RPA bots or other intelligent automations for the smaller things. The analogy I love to use is trying to fill up a bucket. You put the big rocks in, that's the stuff in the top row with the center. And then by having this employee-led program, you're filling sand in or filling in little pebbles around you. It's the smaller stuff, but it adds a lot of value. It's the things that the center-led would not, it doesn't make sense for them to spend their time on. Now, here's the key. Here, here's the last mile. You have to have governance and rules and uh, quality controls on that bottom path. And we're not saying that this is just the Wild West. You set expectations and you have sharing platforms to monitor the automations that your employees come up with and do some quality checks on them. Make sure that they are using good standards per the training you've given them. Make sure that they are connecting to the right data sources that the enterprise has approved. Now, here's the magic. IT will say, well, they're going to just go automate stuff we don't want them to automate. The reality is they already are. They're just doing it with Excel or some other simple, you know, inefficient tool. They already are doing their jobs because they have to from whatever data sources they can find. By giving them these tools that you can monitor more centrally, like RPA, you actually expose some of those opportunities. Like Mike was talking about earlier, you find, oh, people are trying to automate that task. And wow, five different finance analysts are trying to automate the same task. That must be something that's a real problem in the organization. Let's go fix it. Let's help them get that data from our core data link. Let's address the problem systematically and systemically. And so quite the opposite of creating chaos, this employee-led approach, as we have seen it in practice at large organizations, actually helps expose issues and create more standardization uh, that um, that IT organizations and infosec organizations, when they embrace it, really appreciate and benefit from. So with that, um, Mike, maybe uh, let me uh, hand back to you just to kind of put a wrapper on everything we've talked about here and uh, summarize the, the four uh, key elements. Yeah. So, guys, we, we've talked about these four things for a long time, but I think where we are now is we're really at a level of maturity. Right. When when Kevin was talking about governance, I'm skipping right to level four. When Kevin was talking about governance, we've matured a long way. Right. These conversations with CIOs and their organizations are completely different now. When we talk about, you know, the sense of we have to have reuse, reusability in order to to really accelerate and scale a program. Those technologies and capabilities are maturing now as part of sharing. Right. And then, of course, you know, on the, from a build perspective, it's the, it's the combination now, right? So that brings us to upskilling, making sure I have an army of developers, as well as coordinating that with the centralized organization is really how we're going to accelerate to scale with build. Thanks, Mike. With that, heartfelt thank you for all of you for hanging in and listening to us talk. Hopefully you got something out of it. Hopefully you heard some interesting tidbits that uh, can lead you to go back and have a conversation within your organization. Uh, we are always, of course, uh, happy to engage in conversations, uh, as are uh, many of the leaders in the organizations that have started to experiment with this employee-led automation approach. Uh, I really do believe it's the next wave uh, of where we're going to see broader and broader use of automation technologies. And uh, excited to have, uh, have you come along on this uh, discussion journey with us today. So thank you all.